Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love, your grace, and your mercy, Lord. The care that you take over every one of us, Lord God. And Lord, we ask you to be here with us in this service this morning, Lord. As we lift your name up, Lord God, we ask that your presence would be felt in this place, God. We ask that you would move as only you can do, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hallelujah. Lord, we, wor we worship you today, God. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you for the blood that's been applied, Lord God, that we were so unworthy of, so undeserving. God, that price that you paid for us. God, you're worthy of our highest praise this morning. You're deserving of the best of our praise and worship, God. Our devotion, our adoration. God, today, be lifted up in our hearts and minds, Lord God. Help us to see, God, that we need your spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to help us, to refresh us, do, to do the work only he can do in our hearts this morning. Lord, we yield to you. We submit to you. We plead the blood over this service. We pray that you would have your way in this place. That there would be changed hearts and changed lives for your glory. We thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. You can be seated. This morning. We're going to do something this morning that we haven't done in a while, but I feel we need to, and that's to pray for those who need a touch, who need a healing, or a touch in some way. And we want to call you forward this morning. We're going to anoint you with oil. As James chapter 5 says, it says, Is any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church. Let them pray. The prayer of faith. Amen. That oil just represents the Holy Spirit saturating every part of our life. Maybe you're there this morning. You're sick in body or you're struggling financially or you're having family issues or something the devil is attacking you with this morning and it's troubling you. The Holy Spirit wants to saturate every part of your life. Amen. Every demon spirit has to flee when the Holy Spirit begins to move. Amen. Do you believe that this morning? Demon spirits like to try and influence us. As a Christian, they can't come on the inside. But how many know they can make a lot of noise on the outside? Distract us, discourage us. But we need the power of the Holy Spirit, amen, to come and to touch us today. And if you have a need this morning, I know there's many who are not here. And if you'd like to stand in for them, we can do that as well and pray for you. I know Ruby needs a touch from the Lord. I know Gloria is sick and needs a touch from the Lord. But if you need a touch from the Lord, either healing or some way you need God to move in your life this morning, we're going to take a few minutes and pray for these and do. If you have everything going fine this morning, I want to encourage you to come. And would you as a brother and sister in Christ, would you lay hands in agreement on these that have a need? The Bible says in Matthew 18, 19, is if any two or three of you agree as touching any one thing, it shall be done. How many know the agreement has to go this way first? But then when we agree with God and then we agree with each other, Satan has to flee. Amen? There has to be an answer. And we're going to believe the Lord for that. Take a few moments this morning. If you have a need, make your way down here. If you don't have a need, come and pray with these who do. And let's believe the Lord to touch hearts today.
this morning, God, for the lives that are being touched, God, even right now as we're in your presence. Lord, we thank you for the breakthroughs that are coming. Lord, for those who cannot be here this morning because they're sick in body or they're struggling, Lord, I pray that you'll bring a breakthrough today, that you'll reach down and touch them and bless them and help them today. Lord, we are dependent upon you, God, for our strength. Lord, we want to, Lord, persevere, Lord God, to the end and have a faith, God, that doesn't quit. So, Lord, encourage us and strengthen us today as we see you moving in these situations. We just give you glory. We give you praise for all that you're doing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Message number two in the series Surpassing Righteousness. And this is probably going to be a four part series. So if you missed the first part, make sure you go and listen to it. I believe there's a message that the Lord is speaking to us that's for right now, that's for our church, that's for you, it's for me. And so if you missed that first message, uh, we're not going to rehash everything from that message this morning, but there'll be four different parts. And we're going to look at message number two this morning. And we're going to look at Isaiah 64 in just a moment. Uh, listen to this illustration before we get into the word. The Chinese character for righteousness is most interesting. It is composed of two separate characters, one standing for a lamb, the other for me. When lamb is placed directly above me, a new character, righteousness, is formed. Isn't that interesting? This is a helpful picture of the grace of God. Between me, the sinner, and God, the Holy One, there is interposed by faith the Lamb of God. By virtue of His sacrifice, He has received me on the ground of faith, and I have become righteous in His sight. What does the Word of God say about our righteousness? We talked a little bit about this in our first message two weeks ago, but what does the Word of God say about our righteousness? Isaiah 64, 6. If you'd like to stand in honor of God's Word this morning, we're going to look at a couple of passages. Isaiah 64, 6. It says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we do all faint as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Then Romans chapter 3. If you want to turn there quick, right turn in your Bible, big right turn. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18, it says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands, there is none that seeks after God. I lost my place here. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher, a tomb, or a grave. With their tongues they have used deceit, the poison of asps, or snakes, is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Some passages in the Word of God where God tells us His view of righteousness. Amen. You can be seated this morning. As I said in our first message... In the title, Surpassing, in this message title, Surpassing in this message series title is not intended to be a verb. I'm not trying to give you instructions on how to go past righteousness, but it's intended to be an adjective describing the type of righteousness God wants His true followers to possess, a surpassing righteousness. So I want us to understand that before we go on. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20, Jesus said this, and this is the basis for this message, as well as Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees and Sadducees all throughout the New Testament. But Matthew 5, 20 says this, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed or surpass the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. He's saying you're not even saved if you don't have the surpassing righteousness that He wants to give us. Amen? There's no other place to get it other than from God. Amen. The surpassing righteousness that we're talking about. And so we're going to review a couple of things this morning before we move on in the series. 
last week or last time we were together, we looked at four categories of righteousness. Number one, do you remember? Self-righteousness, right? The Pharisees and the Sadducees were dripping with self-righteousness. They were saturated with self-righteousness. Number two, there's relative righteousness. Well, at least I'm not as bad as... You fill in the blank, right? The Pharisees and Sadducees had relative righteousness. Works righteousness, thinking that we can earn the ferret, the favor and the merit or merit the favor of God and his grace that is unmerited. Works righteousness. There's a lot of people, a lot of Pharisees and Sadducees in Jesus' day, a lot of people who go to church every Sunday in America in 2024 who are trying to earn something from God, and you can't earn what Jesus already purchased through his blood, through his finished work. And then number four is imputed righteousness. And imputed righteousness is what we want. Amen? We don't want self-righteousness. We don't want relative righteousness. We don't want works righteousness. We want God's imputed righteousness. He puts it in us. Amen? It's like a transplant. Same as the love of God described in 1 Corinthians 13. Have you ever read that chapter and said, God, I don't, I don't possess any of these. I don't possess most of these. I'm not born with most of these characteristics that are listed about godly love. So how do we get the love of God in our hearts? He does a heart surgery, doesn't he? Yeah. He strips away all the ugliness out of our heart. And he implants that love that 1 Corinthians 13 talks about. And it's the same thing he does with righteousness. He has to implant. He has to put in us Christ's righteousness because we're not born with it. Amen. We're born with a sin nature. We're born prone to sin. Brother Larson, one of my, uh, Lauren Larson, one of my Bible college professors, says you don't have to teach a two-year-old how to, how to, that they have a, you don't have to, if you don't think there's a sinful nature, take two two-year-olds and one rubber ducky and put them in a bathtub. <laughs> Amen? You don't have to teach a kid about, a, I mean, you better teach a kid about a, a light socket on the side of the wall, right? They, they will go to that light socket whether they've ever seen that before or not. We're born with a sin nature. We're prone. We're bent towards sin. And that's why we need God's imputed righteousness. He has to transplant it into our lives. What the Pharisees and Sadducees had was self-righteousness. It was relative righteousness. It was works righteousness. But what Jesus said they needed and what we need today in 2024 is Christ's imputed righteousness. We looked at the first eight traits of Pharisaical righteousness last time. And today I'd like to look at the next eight and see what the Lord is showing us through his ministry in the, in the New Testament. Number nine of the ones that we're looking at. Number nine, a trait of Pharisaical righteousness. They love to quibble over minor matters. Look at Matthew chapter 19, verses 2 through 12. We're going to look at a lot of scriptures, so uh, a lot of sword drills today. Have your fingers ready if you'd like to turn there. Matthew 19, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more two, but one flesh. But therefore God is joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement, and to put her away? He says unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication and shall marry another, commits adultery. Whosoever marries her which is put away does commit adultery. His disciples say unto him, if the case of a man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, all men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs, eunuchs, if you don't know what that is, it's like a chamberlain. They become emasculated for the king's sake so that they are no threat to the king. They, they, they have no um, ability to be with a woman if, that, if you're not getting it. A eunuch. That's, they've done that to be an absolute servant to the king. In other words, chamberlain, which is probably something you're more familiar with. There are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. 
And there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. And it's interesting. Jesus is doing miracles, right? He's preaching the gospel. And what are these religious leaders coming to him about? Not to say glory to God for this person who is just miraculously healed. But they want to quibble with him about matters like this, right? And these matters are important enough. Jesus addresses them. But the whole reason he, he addresses them is he needs to get back to what he's sent here for, right? To seek and to save that which is lost. And all these religious want to, leaders want to do is they want to major on, the, major on the minors and minor on the majors, right? That's what this whole conversation is about. They're not really interested in Jesus' answer. They're trying to trip him up. And quibble over small things. We as believers today, we need to major on the majors. What is our main responsibility as a believer? Amen? We need to find the common ground that we have as believers in Christ in these last days and not look for so many divisions. We need to agree on people getting saved. We need to agree on prayer and evangelism in our community and join hands with whoever, even if they're not a part of our church. Amen? We need to have... Uh, an understanding of what God has called us here to do. The Great Commission. Amen. To go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. That's what the world needs. The world doesn't need more head knowledge about all these things that the Pharisees and Sadducees are asking Jesus about. In fact, what do you think most of the crowd did as the Pharisees spoke out and asked Jesus all these questions? What would you do? See you later. They were more interested in the miracles and his teaching. And I guarantee you, it doesn't tell us in the text, but I guarantee you most of them walked away. Yeah. And Jesus just had an audience with those religious leaders who wanted to quibble over minor matters. So we must surpass this, have a surpassing righteousness, not get caught up in meaningless temporary issues. What's going to matter most in heaven is souls. Amen. And Jesus demonstrated that. Number 10. Trade the pharisaical righteousness. They think everybody is talking about them, and they retaliate. Look at Matthew 21, verses 45 and 46. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spoke of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude, because they, the multitude, took Jesus to be a prophet. All right? We must surpass this pharisaical trait of thinking everybody's talking about us. It's all about image in our social media world that we live in, isn't it? We have to be careful that we're so concerned about what everybody else thinks and we're dismissing what God thinks about our lives or about a situation. We must surpass this and be concerned with what God is saying about us more than what man is saying about us. The Pharisees and Sadducees wanted a great reputation in the crowd. And as a believer, you're probably not going to have that if you're truly living for God, putting your faith in Him and walking in simple obedience. You're going to eventually have a crowd who does not like what God's doing in your life because it convicts them, doesn't it? And so we need to understand the kind of righteousness God wants us to have will help us to not be concerned with what the crowd is saying and to be more concerned about what God is saying. Number 11, Pharisaical trait of, of uh, the religious leaders of Jesus' day. They used, they used their own hypocrisy to attempt to trap others. Matthew 22, verses 15 through 21, it says this. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that you are true. Let's butter him up first, right? We know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Neither care you for any man, for you regard not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt you me, you hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought him unto him a penny. And he says unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then says he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. What a wise answer Jesus gives them. Amen? The Spirit of God was helping him because he was, it was like one of those questions, have you stopped beating your wife, right? <laughs> Men, if you were asked that, have you stopped beating your wife and you're on camera with TMZ or, or uh, 
they don't have Inside Edition, I don't think anymore, but one of those kind of programs, you know, Inquirer magazine, if that's even still around, they say, have you stopped beating your wife? No matter how you answer, you're going to be in trouble, aren't you? Yeah. Yes, I've stopped beating my wife, so that means I used to beat my wife, <laughs> which makes me a rascal. Or if I say, no, I haven't stopped beating my wife, I'm still currently beating my wife, right? <laughs> now, isn't that what they did to Jesus here? Yes. No matter how he answered, they thought they had him. They had him in a trap, because if he said something wrong about Caesar, what would they do? They would go tell the Roman officials and say, Jesus is trying to set himself up against the Roman Empire. But God gives him wisdom how to answer. And we need to understand what Jesus demonstrated here. Christ likeness. Amen. Christ being formed in us. That's true righteousness. We must surpass this. We must have integrity at all times. Instead of changing who we are based on who we're hanging out with. Isn't that what the scribes and Pharisees did? They would go talk to the Romans. And when they were around the Romans, they would, you know, say things that were pleasing to them. And then they would go to the people they're supposed to be leading as religious leaders. And they would say something totally different. Almost opposite at times. We need to have integrity uh, in our, our Christian walk. Not hypocrisy. Not using hypocrisy trying to trap others. Number 12. It says they load their students with unnecessary burdens. Look at Matthew 23, verses 1 through 4. Then spoke Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. What we expect of others, we better be willing to do ourselves if we're going to be saying that we're clothed in Christ's righteousness. What kind of accountability did Jesus have? What kind of accountability did he demonstrate? He's the son of God. Did he even need accountability? Good question to think about. But what did he demonstrate as our perfect example? You believe he was our perfect example? Everything he asked of his disciples, and if you can prove me wrong, I challenge you to do it. But I don't think you can. Everything Jesus asked of his disciples. This is biblical accountability. Not Pharisees and Sadducees accountability. They asked people to do things they weren't doing themselves. Everything Jesus asked of his followers, he'd either already done or was currently doing. Yes. Amen? If you look in scriptures, you will find it every time. That's accountability. And that's what we need if we're going to be clothed. In Christ's righteousness. We have to practice what we preach. Amen. Jesus told the disciples that the greatest among you will be your servant. Matthew 23, 11. It's not the one who has the most control, the most responsibilities, the most sway in a particular situation. But it's the one who serves that will be the greatest. And Jesus led by example. He even washed his disciples' feet. Greatest uh, example of servanthood. We must surpass this. We must lead by example with a servant's heart. Amen? We are, this life is just a vapor. The opportunities that God has placed us in and, and fashioned us for, if you're in a position of leadership, it's for a short period of time in light of eternity. You better spend your life wisely. Amen? Be a servant. Be humble. Be broken and contrite, trembling at God's word so that we can lead by example. Number 13. Pharisaical traits of righteousness. They bask in being seen by others. Matthew 23, verses 5 and 6. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries. You know what the phylacteries are? I think they've shown them on The Chosen, maybe. If you guys have watched The Chosen. They're like leather straps or sometimes a little box. And they would actually put parchment or pieces of Scripture in those boxes. And this was not in Scripture. It was a tradition that they added to Scripture the Pharisees and Sadducees, and they thought that by having it on their forehead, I think it was also on their wrist maybe, there was two places they could put it, that it was the Word of God was close to their minds. But it was just outward. It wasn't inward. You could be wearing a phylactery every day and not be living out the Word of God. Much like a lot of us in America, we wear a Christian t-shirt, we have a Christian bumper sticker on our car, but that doesn't mean that we're acting like a Christian, right? Or that we're demonstrating Christ's likeness. And so it says that about them here. They make broad their phylacteries and lard the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. 
They want to be seen. Yeah. Right? What God sees is more important than what man sees. We need to understand that today. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting with verse 1, it says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hid things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. What are we here for? Amen? You better have a pastor who's here in your church for Christ to be formed in the congregation members. Congregation members, you better come to church not out of works righteousness or serve in a ministry team. And we're grateful for many, many of you who serve in areas of ministry. But the motive is more important than the actual action. Amen? I'm coming to church because I want Christ to be formed in me. As a congregation member. I'm going to Sunday school because I not only need the preaching of God's word. But I'm hungry for the teaching of God's word. I show up to prayer meeting not to put a check mark on my list. Or have God put a gold star next to my name. But because the presence of God shows up in prayer meeting. And I need his presence in my life. Amen. I want Christ to be formed in me. We've got to check our motivation. Because the scribes and Pharisees had lost they were doing all the outward motions, but they had lost the motivation that God wanted them to have for living their, their, their walk of faith. We must surpass this. Let our praise come from God and not from man. If nobody on this earth notices us and what we're doing in simple faith and simple obedience to God, it will not go unnoticed with God. There will be a day that you will be rewarded. And it will be something so much better than a plaque, a dinner, a pat on the back or a handshake, amen? It's going to be something that lasts for eternity. Yeah. I want Christ to be formed in my life, and I want Him to receive the glory now and forever, amen? That's what we need to have that the Pharisees and Sadducees had lost. Number 14, they flaunt their titles. Look at Matthew 23, verses 7 through 12. Greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Ooh, I could take some time there in the modern church but I'll just leave it right there just because you're called rabbi doesn't make you an authority in 2024 on anything and this is the verse that should tell us that I'll leave it at that but be not called rabbi for one is your master even Christ and all you are brethren call no man your father upon the earth for one is your father which is in heaven neither be called masters for one is your master even Christ but he that is greatest among you Again, shall be your servants. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The Lord's telling us this morning that we need to get out of the way, isn't he? We need to point people to Jesus Christ. It's about Christ being formed in my life, in my family's life, in my brothers and sisters. Amen? And anything that's coming against that, we need to pray against. We need to say, no, that's not what it's all about. Amen? Lay that at the foot of the cross. We need to get out of the way so people can see Jesus. John the Baptist would say in John 3.30, He must increase, talking about Jesus, but I must decrease. That should be the motto of every Christian. Amen? I don't need to become greater. Jesus needs to become greater in my life. We must surpass this pharisaical righteousness and focus people's hearts on who Jesus is. He's the righteous one. Amen? And he wants to make us righteous. Number 15, they prevent others from entering the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 23, verses 13 and 14. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer or allow you to them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. Manipulating people for our own benefit. That's religion. That's pharisaical righteousness. That's 
not the kind of righteousness God wants us to be living in. We must surpass this, and we must be consumed with a compassion for lost souls. Amen? Be in the right, uh, be in the master's business. Amen? Not what the rest of the world is doing. In the business world where they step on whoever they have to to get to the top. We need to be about the master's business. And his business was seeking and saving that which was lost. Number 16. This last trait we're going to look at this morning. Pharisaical righteousness. They make converts who also become pharisaical. It shouldn't be surprising, right? Your children can look at you when they become adults and they can say, I, I became just like you. What you taught me is what I've become. But boy, that hurts us as parents, right? And sometimes we grieve over the mistakes that we've made and thank God for His grace and that He teaches us and we do our best as parents, but as disciples of other people as well. They're not going to become any more than we are, right? And that's why we need to point them to Jesus. We need to show them that they need Christ formed in them. When we fail, when we uh, fall short in some area, Jesus never will. Amen? Point them to Jesus because Pharisees produce more Pharisees. Matthew 23, 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you can pass or travel sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twice more the child of hell than yourselves. Jesus, say what you really mean, right? <laughs> Jesus gets right to the point. Why did he have to speak so harshly? If you read Matthew 23, the whole chapter, why did Jesus, he never spoke like that to the lost, did he? Yeah. Unsaved people? Because these people thought they were fine. They're clothed in self-righteousness, relative righteousness, and works righteousness. And Jesus knew if they weren't shook out of that, they were going to go straight to hell. And that's why he spoke so harshly to them in Matthew 23. You're going to become... You're making disciples who follow you who are twice the more child of hell than yourself. Our new converts need to be discipled to become more like Jesus. We must teach them to evidence proper, exclusive, relentless, consistent faith in who the Bible says Jesus is and in what the Bible says Jesus accomplished for us at Calvary. Those are the kind of disciples we want from BPC. Amen? Not people that look to this organization or this pastor or this program of our church, but people who understand the faith that God recognizes, the faith that God accepts, and that's faith in Jesus, amen, in His finished work. With this type of faith that God recognizes, the new convert can then learn how to pray. We need to teach them that. Sometimes they don't know how to pray. They can then, with the right kind of faith, read their Bibles, go to church, and they can learn the basics that will position them for growth in their relationship with God. But we have to teach him it's not works righteousness. I pray because I am saved, not praying to earn salvation from God. Amen. I read my Bible because I am saved. And I can't get enough of it because Jesus loves me and I understand that relationship that I have with him. And I want to read the Bible. It's not a chore, it's something I love to do because he has made the change in me before I started reading. I come to church because I don't want to miss. And how many know that the one Sunday you miss <laughs> is when God does something powerful? And sometimes we have to miss, I know, because of life, because of work. It's not condemnation. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. But we come to church because we're saved, not to earn gold stars from God or brownie points, but because we love Him and we want to be in His presence. We want what He has to say to us. Amen. And that's what these Pharisees and Sadducees were missing. We must surpass this religious righteousness that the Pharisees had and develop our new converts into fully devoted followers of Jesus. God, may Christ be formed in me and may the disciples that you used me to reach, the people that you used me to help teach in Sunday school or to help in youth or to help in children's ministry or whatever ministry of the church, may they look just as much like Jesus as I, I, I am, or even more, amen, as we point them to who Jesus is and what he did. Listen to this quick story, and then we're going to close this morning. If we look through a piece of red glass, everything is red. If we look through a piece of blue glass, everything is blue. If we look through a piece of yellow glass, everything is yellow, and so on. When we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior, God looks at us through the Lord 
Jesus Christ. He sees us in all the white holiness of His Son. Our sins are imputed to the account of Christ, and His righteousness is imputed to our account. Amen? That's what we want. I want to be clothed in Christ's righteousness. When God looks down and He sees me, He doesn't see me and my failures. If my failures and my sins are put under the blood, who does He see? He sees His Son. What does He say? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That's how we please the Lord. Amen? Be clothed in Christ's righteousness. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to ask James if he could to come back to the piano. I know this is a lot of preaching and teaching, but I believe it's a necessary message that we need in this day that we're living in. We need to be righteous people. Amen? There's a lot of people who don't come to church because of the hypocrites. How foolish that is, right? We're going to spend eternity in hell with the hypocrites because we won't come to church and position ourselves to hear from God, but we won't come to church because of the hypocrites. But that also tells us as a church some things about us, right? God, I don't want hypocrisy to be what characterizes my church. I want to have a sincere faith. I want everybody in my church. I pray for you throughout the week as your pastor. I pray for our board members. I pray for individuals who are going through stuff. And I pray more than anything that Christ be formed in us. And sometimes it takes the difficulties. I don't like it. I feel the pain as a pastor that you're, you're expressing in your needs and that I see going on. And I wish we didn't have to go through any of the pain. But, you know, sometimes the pain is what allows Christ to be formed deeply in us. Amen? He's, we wouldn't know He's our healer if we ever never got sick. We wouldn't know how much of a provider He is if we weren't scraping two pennies together trying to pay a bill. Amen? We need to say, God, I want Christ to be formed in my brothers and sisters in Christ. I want Christ to be formed in this church. I want Jesus to be to have the preeminence in our church. And I want it to be about your righteousness, your holiness, the beauty of your holiness, the splendor of your majesty, and not about me, not about flesh, not about the things that really don't matter in eternity. God, I want your righteousness in my life. I want your righteousness in my church. And you know what this community Jefferson County, Harper's Ferry, they don't need another church full of hypocrites. And I'm not saying we are, but I'm saying that's what they say, right? How can we combat that? We can argue with them and get red in the face. That's not going to change anything. Or we can listen to what God's saying to us in these messages and say, God, help me to be more righteous. Help me to be truly holy so that when people look at us, even maybe from the outside looking and they see you, Jesus, they don't see Another hypocrite. Amen. And that's what we need to pray for. Amen. This morning, as we close this message this morning, I don't know where your heart is at, but God does. You can be made righteous. If you're in this room this morning or listening to this message at a later date, God wants you to know that you can be made righteous. You can be made clean and free from your sins today. That decision, that action can be settled this morning. It won't happen through self-righteousness. It won't happen through relative righteousness or works righteousness. But it's only going to happen through you believing and receiving God's plans to make you righteous. And that was through His only Son, Jesus. Who He is and what He came to do at the cross. If you'll believe in that today, and just say, God, I believe the plan that you had to make me righteous. God, I believe it was enough. And God, I want my sins to be forgiven. I want to be clean. I don't want to feel like I'm dirty on the inside because of the sins that I can't quit doing. God, I want to be free. And I believe that the blood that Jesus spilled out on the cross is for me. God, I want that personal relationship, that walk with God. God can set you free this morning. Amen. You can have a no-so salvation, not a hope-so. You can know that you're ready to meet Jesus. And if you don't have that this morning, I want to encourage you to pray this prayer with us today. If you've gotten away from God, maybe you were once serving the Lord, but you're that prodigal son or daughter, and you've been going your own way, sowing your wild oats, God says it's time to come home. And the Father's waiting with open arms to receive you and to impute His righteousness to you again, to clean up all the dirtiness and the filthiness that the enemy has tried to destroy your life with. God wants to clean you up. And if that's you this morning, you can pray this prayer as well. God wants to free you today. 
He wants to help you today. Would you pray this prayer with me to help those who might be praying this for the first time or to rededicate their hearts to the Lord? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name, admitting and acknowledging that I am a sinner. I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross for my sins, paying the penalty that I deserved. And I am in need of you, Jesus, to be my Savior, to be my Lord. Please forgive me for all my sin. Wash me. Make me clean. And help me from this day forward to live for you. Thank you for saving me, making me ready for heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer this morning, let somebody know who's a believer today. Let them know that that you've surrendered your heart to Jesus, that you've made him the Lord of your life. Get a Bible and start reading it. Let God speak to you through his word. Let him tell you the things that he has, the plans that he has for your life and the word of God. Get plugged into a local church. Grow in your walk with the Lord as you stand with other believers who are letting Christ be formed in them. Amen. Be in church. Learn how to pray. Find the scriptures in the Bible that talk about prayer where Jesus teaches us how to pray. And make that a discipline. Make that a habit in your life of talking to God and telling him what's going on in your life. Believers, before we dismiss this morning is the purity of Jesus Christ and his righteousness what you were clothed with this morning? Is that what's shining through in your conduct every day? Is the Holy Spirit maybe putting his finger on some area of unrighteousness? that he wants to purge from your heart and your life. I want us to take some time this morning and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal what needs to change in us this morning. Amen? Search me, O God. See if there be some wicked way in me. Let's let the Holy Spirit purge us. Let's let him prune us. Amen? So that we can continue to be fruitful. So that we continue to have evidence of God working in and through our lives for his purpose. Amen? For his kingdom's cause. So I want to encourage you, would you find an altar of prayer for just a few moments this morning as James sings this song? And let's say, God, make me righteous. Make me holy. Clothe me in your righteousness. If there's areas that God's convicted you about, lay those down at his feet this morning. And let's let him touch us.
in our lives. So forgive us where we've acted the way the Pharisees and the Sadducees did in dead, dry religion. Teach us what real relationship with you looks like. Teach us more about your imputed righteousness. Remind us, God, that we only receive it by way of Calvary, Lord God. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. But God, you give it to us through your amazing grace, through your redemption plan. God, help us to be made more like you today. Clothe us in your righteousness. May people not see hypocrisy and inconsistencies in our life, but may they see a constant faith in who you are, Jesus. May they see a persevering faith in all that you purchased for us at Calvary. God, may it spill over from our lives into their lives. That they might know you, that they might have Christ formed in their hearts as well. God, bless that person on our right and our left. God, you know the burdens that they're carrying today. Lord, we believe you to lift heavy burdens, God, to bring relief, to bring peace, to bring joy, to bring hope. God, we're asking that for our brothers and sisters today. God, may we move forward as a church, God, in the things that you have for us this week. May we see a harvest of souls, God. May we see revival come into our community, an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. And may we be involved in what you're doing, God, working for your kingdom's cause this week. Use us to sow a seed of the gospel in someone else's life that needs it this week that you bring across our path. Lord, we just thank you for it. Give us a great afternoon, God. Bless our food and fellowship downstairs that we have for OCC. God, I pray you bless it to the nourishing of our bodies. And God, just give us a great restful afternoon today. We thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name.